Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gita Marie. Plastic has been a focal point, a center of attention on this platform ever since I started making videos for YouTube about zero waste, about sustainability, about how you as an individual and as a consumer can get engaged and get an overview of what's happening in the world and what we can do to improve ourselves. Plastic has been a part of this ever since the beginning. Plastic is a major focal point in the zero waste movement, so obviously we've talked about this a lot. And I think we're gonna go back to basics today a bit because there has just very recently been a new study published that have shown that we have have detected microplastic in ovaries, which is unsurprising because we have previously seen studies that have shown microplastic in stool samples from people all across the globe. We've seen studies that have found microplastic in blood, in embryos. And hear me out here, it's a good thing that we have studies that continuously confirm that we are in contact with microplastic particles in every single aspect of our lives today. Because when we keep studying it, when we keep funding the research, we're also steps closer to getting an overview of what the consequences are. Because still to this day, it's really difficult to say specifically what it means, what consequences it has for the human body, what consequences it has for biodiversity, for ecosystems, etc. But we know it's not great. The study that recently came out showing microplastic particles in ovaries start to question and start to seek out more information as to how microplastic contamination and the exposure to microplastic can have an effect on reproductivity. Kind of important. So to be a bit topical, let's talk about some of the ways where we can minimize, reduce, our exposure to microplastic today. Let's keep it short, concise, and easy to understand. But I would like to say this, it is impossible to not be in contact with microplastic. It is quite literally everywhere, which is terrifying, but I have some more information around the end that I think provides a bit of a nuance. So we're not just gonna sit here with a feeling of everything is doomed, that is not the point. However, there are ways of acting, there are ways of using materials and ways of using things in our homes that can either increase or decrease the amount of plastic particles that we get in contact with. So I think we all should know this. Looking at food and beverages, we are often in contact with sources of microplastic pollution when we heat food and store food, specifically when we heat and store food in plastic. When you expose plastic to heat, for instance, from the sun, or for instance, from the microwave, you start to degrade the material. And when the material starts to degrade, it starts to release microplastic particles, which you get in your food that you then eat. So one thing that you can do is minimize the amount of plastic you microwave and you put hot food into. Years ago, I demonized every single kind of plastic food container, but today I keep cold food in plastic containers all the time instead of throwing them away and buying something new. But whenever I have to microwave something or whenever I have to put something in the oven, obviously not plastic. Whenever I have hot food, I don't transfer it to plastic containers, I transfer it to something in metal or glass instead, ceramics as well. Side note, don't put metal storage containers into the microwave, but glass and ceramics should be perfectly fine. Every time you have to do with hot food, see if you can avoid plastic packaging of all kind. And this is a little bit of a cliche zero waste hack, but choose unpackaged produce. Processed and packaged foods often has a higher level of microplastic particles than food that isn't wrapped in plastic and is less processed. The tips I'm sharing here, by the way, is a combination of things I know and do myself and things that I've seen other sources cite. That is a really good idea that you can do. So like, take it or leave it, but this is how you can reduce the contamination of microplastic. But I don't do all of this. For instance, I don't have a water filter. It is generally recommended that you have a water filter because there is microplastic plastic in our water, which is fantastic. <laughs> and bottled water doesn't really help you because bottled water contain generally higher amounts of plastic than non-bottled water because of the sources of the water in the bottle, but also because the bottle is made from plastic. And this is something I didn't think about myself, but it makes perfect sense, but you can be cautious with sea salt. Now I don't use sea salt specifically. I use a more so processed iodinized kind of salt because I follow a plant-based diet and that's a great way to get your iodine. But if you want to reduce the amount of microplastic in your food, looking at the kind of salt you use can actually be a really good idea, either by choosing a salt that has been through a pure Purity test or consider alternatives to sea salt. One of the things that can actually help you a ton in your home is cleaning regularly, either by using a vacuum cleaner with a filter or wet mop the floors because the dust that collects and gathers 
in your house contains plastic particles, so getting rid of them regularly will ultimately spare you some contamination. It's also recommended to use air purifiers, and I have to be honest, this is never something I've done. I open my windows regularly and make sure to get a good airflow in my home, but I don't have an air purifier. There's obviously benefits to it, and if you're sensitive or allergic to stuff as well, it makes perfect sense. I've never prioritized it, and I don't think I will in the future either. This one kind of explains itself, but opting for natural materials in your home. Carpets, rugs, couches, any kind of material that has to do with fabric. If you choose synthetic fibers like polyester, polyester being a synthetic fiber that is made from plastic. So whenever you wear synthetic fibers, down, it's going to release particles when you use it, wear it, sit on it, wash it. So choosing natural materials will be beneficial here and will also limit your contamination. This obviously doesn't only go for furniture, it also goes for clothing. And making sure to primarily rely on natural fibers in clothing, I honestly feel is easier as well. Simply choosing natural organic fibers rather than polyester clothing can in some cases be a little bit tricky, for instance with underwear, swimwear, active wear, all of which I also own in polyester and other synthetic materials because it's really difficult to find alternatives. But the vast majority of my everyday clothes, like shirts, trousers, dresses, skirts, that kind of thing, primarily natural fibers. I would go as far as to say that every single person that has clothing has clothing that contains a certain level of polyester. So it's not something we necessarily can avoid 100%. So one of the things that you can do is that you can make sure that you wear it, maintain it and clean it in a way that minimizes the amount of microplastic that's released. What you can do is installing a microplastic particle filter in your washing machine. If we go back to the kitchen for a little while, because there are more stuff that we can do here. One of the things we can avoid is using plastic kitchen utensils, because whenever we use them, we scrape them, whenever we wash them and store them and wear them down, they also release microplastic. Opting for metal or wood is in many ways just really beneficial here. Plus it's really easy to find really nice wooden utensils in thrift stores. Maybe this goes without saying, but non-stick pans? I have a whole video about non-stick pans and how to use stainless steel pans if you're a beginner and it feels really intimidating. There are ways. Even small areas of damage done to non-stick coating can release tens of thousands of microplastic particles. So this can be a really massive source to microplastic contamination. And this is one of my pet peeves of all time. I haven't owned one of these things in 15 years. Plastic cutting boards. If you have a plastic cutting board, I recommend finding some way of using it that doesn't involve the food that you eat. Plastic cutting boards are basically impossible to actually get clean because there are tons of tiny microscopic ridges and small nooks and crannies where bacteria can really thrive. It's really difficult to get clean. And whenever you chop something on it, whenever you use it, you're also scraping off plastic particles directly into your food. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. It's also recommended to avoid plastic sponges and synthetic dishcloths, instead using something that's made from cotton and other organic natural fibers. And this is where acting sustainably can be really difficult because you might see one benefit over here, but then there is a detrimental consequence and effect over here. For instance, many organic natural products tend to be free from plastic, which is nice, but might still have a bigger carbon footprint. It's really give and take, and it is very complex. But for this video specifically, we're talking about reducing microplastic contamination. So that's what we're focusing on. But check out some of my other videos where I compare different kinds of products, because you might be surprised. Just because something is without plastic doesn't necessarily make it sustainable. That's not the scope of this video. If you're confused, that's completely fair. I think that is a human reaction. We are gonna try and zoom in a little bit and then we will zoom out in another video. Okay, this to me feels like a no-brainer, but I don't think everyone feels that way. Implementing a no-shoe policy in your home can also limit your plastic particle contamination because we drag in tons of microplastic particles on our shoes when we walk on asphalt, when we walk on the roads, the pavement. Whenever we venture outside, we drag plastic particles with us into our home. And because I'm Danish, we generally, culturally speaking, just have a no-shoe policy. We wear 
home shoes, slippers, that kind of thing, but it's very rare that you see Danish people wearing their shoes around the home. It's odd and in other people's homes it's considered extremely impolite. Implementing a no-shoe policy can be a good way to go as well. This might be tricky, especially if you live in urban areas, but minimizing your exposure to traffic. <laughs> I know, one of the biggest sources of microplastic pollution isn't your skincare products or your toothpaste or your plastic sponge or the polyester clothing that you're wearing although that is a pretty solid source it's car tires and roads and when car tires and roads are worn down they release small tiny bits of what they're made of and they're made from various synthetic components car tires aren't made from natural rubber they're made from plastic and there's also plastic in the asphalt we use to create our roads avoiding microplastic contamination isn't only about what you can do to limit your contamination this is a problem on a global scale which means that one of the more effective ways that we can actually reduce the amount of plastic particles that we are exposed to is by supporting organizations that seek to reduce plastic overall. It's getting engaged politically, it's voting for legislation. There is a lot of work to be done here because at the current rate of production more than 10 billion tons of mismanaged plastic waste will be dispersed in the environment by 2050. And even if this happens on the opposite side of the planet it's still going to affect you. A few aspects or nuances that I think are important to mention here is related to what happens to microplastic when it gets into your system. This is what Michael Hudson, an associate professor in environmental science at the University of Southampton, had to say to The Guardian. We have evolved to deal with inhalation and ingestion of impurities. That's why we have complex respiratory systems and all sorts of trapping devices to stop particles getting into our lungs. It's why we have an immune system that's set up to deal with small foreign bodies, why we have a digestive system that doesn't let larger impurities get into our system, they just pass through. While scientists are calling for more research to be done in this field, what actually happened to the body after 10 years of exposure, 15 years of exposure, 50 years of exposure, because we have qualified guesses but very sparse clinical findings to back it up. But he's trying to not be an alarmist here. He points towards the fact that we have a body that is actually meant to deal with different kinds, but kinds nonetheless, of small foreign bodies getting into our system. It can also be stored various places in the body, but I think it's important to note that a lot of it just passed through our system. That does mean that it can have consequences, but in another few decades, if the environment continues to get more contaminated, I think we have potentially a harmful issue. This is partly due to the sheer volume of microplastic that will be accumulated by then, and we know that the greater the exposure, the greater the risk. There was a study from a few years ago that showed that people who work in textile factories in Bangladesh have been exposed to very high levels of airborne microplastic fibers, and they do get respiratory disease. One of the things that is important to mention here is that if we don't do anything about this while the levels of microplastic in our environment and in our bodies it's going to rise we're going to see higher volumes of microplastic in our bodies and that and that comes with a lot of problems and anything we can do cannot avoid our exposure to microplastic but we can reduce it and we can limit it the way that we personally and individually use plastic materials can be smarter and when we use these materials smarter we can both limit our our own as well as other people's exposure to these materials. What we wear, how we transport ourselves, how we cook and the way we create and maintain our home are all important aspects of understanding how microplastic gets into our system. And the more we know where it is and where it's coming from, the more equipped we are to tackle the problems it will bring in the future. If you want to know more about microplastic, I've made several videos that you can find in the description down below and I'll also link my resources and some ideas for further reading if you're interested. Let me know in the comments if there are any of these these things that you would consider doing now and take really good care of yourselves. Thank you so much for watching, have an amazing day and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!